All right, everyone, welcome back to Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at 2 Bit Idiots from the Citadel. Again, got a very special guest today as part of our special series on the Bitcoin having talking to co founder and CEO of BTC China, and more recently, the founder and CEO of Ballet, which is a physical storage uh, company focused on crypto security and secure storage. Um, Bobby is one of the first people I met in the industry. Um, there's, a con there's a consistent theme with this series of episodes in that pretty much everybody that I've been speaking to, I met for the first time in Las Vegas in 2013, which wow. was the first Bitcoin bubble. Um, and was it, was, December? Uh, it was December, yeah, it was December it was, 2013. It was, it was December, yeah. right after uh, trying to ban Bitcoin for the <laughs> first time of many. Uh, I'm putting you know quotes around that. But um, this was about a year after the first halving. Uh, Bobby, you know, obviously been uh, an early adopter and, and uh, major player in bridging the east-west divide of the community in some respects and, um, and uh, had a, a phenomenal run with BTC China. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, his history, and, uh, and, and get into what he's been working on recently uh, with a colorful bit of commentary in the middle surrounding all the halvings. Um, but Bobby, uh, for starters, uh, for, for those that aren't familiar with you, your background, maybe just a, a quick uh, discussion of how you got into the industry, what you did before crypto, and, um, and how we got to this point today. Sure. So um, I've been in tech. I, I started my career in, uh, at Yahoo. So mm -hmm. there's internet back in late 90s, like 1998. Uh, I, I studied computer science at Stanford. So I, I've always been, you know, math and science kind of guy in tech. And then I got into Bitcoin in early 2011, in the first half of 2011. And my brother, of course, Charlie, uh, he introduced me to Bitcoin. That's when he started mining it. And I started mining soon after that summer. Uh, so it's, you know, it's been, it's been nine years. Time has flown by really fast. Uh, yeah. And I, at the time I was a hobbyist, you know, mining Bitcoin. Uh, I was, I was living in Shanghai in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was working at Walmart, Walmart uh, e-commerce in China, head of their technology department for the e-commerce side. Um, and then I got into full-time Bitcoin in 2013. That's when I got together with my two co-founders and started BTC China, the very first uh, Bitcoin exchange in China. We got funding that year. And then, of course, the FOMO you know, became the... Uh, Bitcoin itself peaked, actually, it actually peaked twice in 2013. Many people didn't know that. The first peak was actually in April of 2013. And then the second bigger peak was in uh, December, November, December, mm -hmm. when it went to $1,200. Mm -hmm. And we, at that time, we, we've actually became the world's largest exchange by trading volume, uh, surpassing, surpassing Mt. Gox. So those were the fun days. Let's, um, you, you ran that business, which had two components, um, uh, you know, two different sides between the exchange and the mining pool that yeah. were definitively impacted by the first halving. So can, can, let's talk about uh, late 2012 um, leading up to that first halving, which really was, it was kind of a novelty at the time because the stakes were still so low just in terms of total market value, but you were still one of the largest centralized entities giving people access to this. And in particular, you know, interfacing with uh, the, the Chinese investor, um, uh, cohorts and then the actual mining community, which is going to be most impacted by this um, the slashing and rewards. At, at that point, what was the sentiment around the having, if anything, or, or was this more just a narrative cycle that um, was good marketing for um, for the industry to actually have yeah. hit this milestone and 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 gotten from you know zero to something that wasn't necessarily going away within the first four years. Yeah. So just to clarify, it, during the first halving, uh, 2012, it was November 2012, um, I was actually on the sideline just as an amateur. I wasn't uh, in it full time yet. So I didn't join BTC oh, okay, China okay. Until, until early spring of 2013. Okay, uh, so that coincided with the, with the run up. Because if you remember the first halving in November 2012, the price was, you know, a dollar, two dollars. You know, it was like under $10 for a long while. Mm -hmm. And it, the price actually didn't budge right around the halving or right after. It was probably three, four, six months later, in starting February of 13, February, March, April. That's when it really ran up and then really surpassed the previous high, which was like 20, 20 some dollars. So I recall distinctly, you know, um, 
2013. And again, this is two years after I got into it, right? I, just thought, I, I was in China. My brother, Charlie, was in, in, in California. I recall distinctly messaging him, you know, sending text messages, oh my gosh, Bitcoin's going to cross $10, $20, it's going to all reach all time high, you know. So those were, I wish I had saved those text messages, but those are fun. Yeah. Um, and, and when did you get into the, uh, the mining pool business? Was that, was that so, later? That was something yeah, was that, later. that happened. So okay. we, yeah, we, um, so BTC China started as, as an exchange first. Uh, it was launched in June of 2011 by my two co-founders. And then I joined mm -hmm. in 2013. And that's when we start turning to company, raise venture financing and all that. Uh, and then, um, so all of, for the rest of 2013, it was just FOMO, you know, price rise and all that. And of course it came crashing down from $1,200 down to 800, down to $500. That was right around 2000, early 2014. And also coincided with the collapse of MT Gox. So that was a big mm -hmm. industry shaking moment at the time. Um, so, and then in, uh, in the summer of 2014, that's when we launched the BTCC pool, the mining pool business. So we, mm -hmm. we, we eventually had uh, three or four businesses, but we started with an exchange, had a mining pool. We launched a wallet, a web wallet called Picasso at first. Uh, and then later we, we named it just pay. And then we also had a mobile wallet called Moby. Mm -hmm. And of course we launched the physical Bitcoins, uh, collection. Uh, called BTC Mint. That was in 2016. But the mining mm -hmm. pool, you know, we ran that pretty well from 2014 till till, till we sold the company. I uh, sold the company in 2018. Yep. Um, so that uh, that that was really, I'd say, the height of euphoria, the depths of despair, uh, <laughs> and then and the the slope of enlightenment. And then you kind of got out uh, right after the 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 second big bubble. Um, yeah. Help people understand um, what what got you excited uh, to go full time in early 2013, um, when you know yes there was some infrastructure that had been spun up, but there really you know Mt. Gox was the only game in town. It was you know th there wasn't really any VC investments. Um, you could have fit all of the entrepreneurs around one table. Um, yeah, yeah. in spring of, of 2013. And in fact, some people did. And, and if, if you kind of remember the, the you know, get togethers uh, in New York and San Francisco and, and, and that's right. elsewhere around that time. Um, what, what made you flip the switch? Uh, yeah, from so just casual it, observer to, to hardcore yeah, industrialist. It was a little bit of circumstances and a little bit of also pre-planning. Um, mm -hmm. I remember distinctly in summer of 2011, after I had discovered Bitcoin, at the time I had a very good full-time role at Walmart doing e-commerce for China. And I recall talking to a VC, of a, a good venture capitalist friend, and I was telling him about Bitcoin. And I said to myself in front of him, I said, you know, if I've ever, at the time, by the way, I was a corporate guy, right? I was working mm -hmm. at you know, Walmart, I worked at Yahoo, worked at EMC. So I've been a corporate big company kind of guy. I've never done a startup in real sense. Um, but I did say to him, distinctly, I said, hey, if, if I ever jump out and do a startup, I'll do it in Bitcoin. And this is in the summer of 2011. And the reason at the time because Bitcoin was really fascinating, right? That notion of digital money, digital asset. Um, it was likened to digital gold. I've always been a fan of gold, decentralized you know, asset. Um, so I said, you know, if I ever do a startup, I'll do it in Bitcoin. And then, of course, you know, two years came to pass, two and a half years came to pass. I left Walmart, actually, no, no, not even two years. It was one and a half years went by. I left Walmart at the end of 2011, sorry, at the end of 2012. Um, and then I was looking for a next role for a new company, for a new company to join. At the time, you know, the default would be to go join another company, a large company, tech company, uh, either in Shanghai, Beijing, or come back to Silicon Valley. Um, and then I, and then I, I was talking to my wife and said, you know what? I could actually do a startup. And if I did a startup, as I promised myself, I'll do it in Bitcoin. So that's when, um, that's when I uh, decided to connect with my two co-founders who had already launched the BTC China website. And we got together, agreed to, to go forward. You know, I was going to take on the CEO role, CEO role and also to raise financing uh, as a startup. So we were the very, very first company in all of Asia to get, to get venture financing. Uh, we got it from Lightspeed, Lightspeed China. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so the rest is history. So we, like you said, it was back then, early 2013, just a handful of entrepreneurs in this ecosystem. Um, wild ride after that, Mt. Gox fails in February of 2014. Um, yeah. From 
February 2014 to January 2015. It's pretty much a straight shot down with a couple of dead cat bounces in the middle. Yeah. Um, and then all of 2015 is basically just apathy, side, sideways yep. trading, no volatility. So it's kind of the best of all worlds because the holders were kind of losing interest. But um, maybe as or more importantly, all of the infrastructure companies were bleeding out because there was no volatility. Correct. <laughs> and, and so there was no trading fees. And so there was no, you know, kind of ongoing revenue to support all this infrastructure that was getting built out. Um, and no subsequent venture investment because it just looked like uh, something that, that people have forgotten about. Um, what, um, you know, we're talking to Dan Matuszewski from, from Circle in the first episode of the series, uh, he, made a, he made a very good point that the 2016 halving was kind of like the event that everybody rallied around. It was like the life raft, yeah. right? Yeah, Everything yeah. had gone to shit in like 2014, 2015. And it was just this like, you know, uh, kind of bumpy ride between 200 and 400 after the highs of, of you know, a thousand and for someone yeah. like, and yeah, and for, for someone like you um, that got in when it was 10 and 20 and you know, getting excited when it hit those milestones, that's still a pretty big run up. But um, people uh, I think fail to appreciate there wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't moments like Andreessen Horowitz raising a $500 million crypto fund in like that bear market, right? <laughs> it was Correct. everybody, everybody was, was kind of running low. Um, is, is there truth to that, right? Or, or, or what helps kind of turn the ship back around um, in your opinion between late 2015 and, and early 2016? Well, what, what do you mean by turn the ship around? You mean- Oh, just get people excited again and-, and, and uh, Well, I, th I, I think, I think um, you know, for good and bad, uh, a lot of the crypto, and I guess it's more the bad. I'm not. Uh, so I, you, you and I are longtime hodlers. We talked about this earlier. You know, we're strong hodlers. I think the weak hodlers sold out their position in 2015. Uh, some really got panicked, sold out in 2014 during the bear market, uh, during, during the crash. And then, of course, during the bear market, 15 and early 16. You know, a lot of people thought hey, it was pointless to hold on to Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's just not performing, right? So we mm -hmm. saw a lot of people s sell out. Um, of course, I personally didn't, and I had long-term faith in Bitcoin. Um, that's also when we launched the first BTCC Mint business with, with the one Bitcoin titanium physical coin. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we launched that business before the halving, and of course, after the halving, we continued to sell, including making poker chips. So 2016 was a very special year for me because we launched that very fun business, physical Bitcoin. We sent them out as gifts. We sold them over online. And uh, of course, the halving came and went, but the price didn't really. So, so in my experience, you know, two times now, the having people anticipate having, they're excited for the price increase. But the reality is, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, the having doesn't increase the price right away. So it's usually the effects of the price increase affect the cost of flow, the the more you know the 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 lower quantity of Bitcoin being mined that takes effect three to six months later. So it wasn't, and, and, and funnily it coincided with Trump's election. So that's when the focus, sorry, my headset keeps falling out. Um, so, so I remember it was, uh, I think it was October, November. That's when, uh, you know, when it crossed $500 again, you know, $500, you know, at the time it was like, oh my gosh, the magic number we have $600, $700. So that's when we cross over that. And of course we know that, by the end of 2016, by early 2017, we reached one thousand dollars. That was a huge, huge milestone. So that will be the equivalent of reaching, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in today's uh, memory. Yep. Yeah. So, so my point, my point is that the, I think the price increase is what brings back the market. I think I don't think the market did anything different to warrant the price increase. I don't think I don't think it's the ecosystem or the companies mm -hmm. that sort of artificially inflated the market, uh, but rather the market came around. Uh, and then the market is a lagging indicator of the supply of Bitcoin. This is a stock to flow theory, mm -hmm. the market prices. And then of course the, the sentiment of the industry is a lagging indicator of the market prices as well. Mm -hmm. So, so by the time when your taxi driver and the Starbucks barista tells you about Bitcoin, that's, that's, that's when you know it's, it's peaked, even though they think they just got it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, did you have concerns uh, going into the having around the health of the mining pool? Uh, help people understand from a pool operator's perspective what 
some of the concerns were um, just for the, the functionality of the network. And, and you can probably make an educated guess that this time around, not going to be dissimilar from last time, where you see a temporary dip with some capacity falling off, but otherwise things correct. The next generation miners come on board and then the difficulty gradually starts ticking back up um, in subsequent months and, and quarters. Um, it is, you know, from, from a, a, a pool operator standpoint, you, have, you must have some insights into the type of machines that are being used, expectations around what capacity would fall off and, um, and how that would, would impact pool performance. Did, um, did your internal forecasts around that time uh, were they pretty close to the reality what actually happened post having in terms of capacity or or was there anything that surprised you or, or took you off guard yeah, we we actually you know during we operated the pool again from fourteen to end of uh, uh, to early two thousand and eighteen so about three mm -hmm. years pat, uh, through the having through that second having mm -hmm. through that second having uh, we didn't do any formal forecasts for for hash power and stuff like that we just maintained a market share between fifteen and twenty five thirty percent of the global mm -hmm global hash rate. Um, uh, of course, that number varied over the years. And then, uh, and then basically at the, before the having, after having our hash power, I think I, I don't have notes from that, but if I recall correctly, it wasn't more than 10, 15, 20%. So it, the, the having is not as detrimental as people w worry for the worse. Uh, this time around, I don't think it's going to be the case either. I think what we, what we see is we, we've seen the, a lot of hash power come in in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, you know, some hash power will drop off. That's to be expected, but it's going to be at most 10, 15, 20%, 25%. It's not going to mm -hmm. be like a dramatic fall off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also don't, don't forget as the price increases in anticipation of the having, we saw that, right? Just barely a few weeks ago, a month ago, it was like it bottom out that $3,000, $4,000. Now it's at, Nine thousand, so it's more than half of where it bottomed out that bottomed out at. Mm -hmm. So that really helps as well. So the higher the price, the more it can sustain in terms of hash power going into and after the halving. Um, and and miners, uh, you can think of as as pro cyclical, where they're only selling as much as they need to um, in order to make ends meet and and ensure that they're covering their overhead. But otherwise, you know, the 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 margin uh, at the margin, they're net longs. Uh, for yeah, the yeah, system yeah. and probably not selling yeah. everything that they're Correct. making. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and they, they many of them even lend out their bitcoins mm -hmm. and get cash with bitcoins on collateral. They get cash to buy and finance the equipment as well as the the facilities, the the hosting costs, and the electricity payments. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them do that, which is which is fine. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your experience operating in uh, China and and in. Uh, Asia in particular, there's obviously a different set of rules uh, that you have to play by um, and the uh, relationships that you need to have, whether you're talking about New York regulators or uh, the, the CCP uh, authorities <laughs> that, that, are, that are ultimately you know, going to gonna want to know exactly what you're doing. Um, yeah. They're not that different um, in, in, uh, with respect to oversight. But culturally, there's there's you know kind of worlds of difference uh, between how the two environments function in practice. What what are um, what are some of the kind of unspoken uh, rules of of operating in that environment, particularly in a frontier asset class like Bitcoin, where you know the CCP has been very outspoken that they don't want investors getting hurt and they want to make sure that this is shunned. But at the end of the day, they don't really seem to care or, yeah. or want to want to involve themselves, I guess, because it's more of a distraction than anything. And, um, and at this point, because mining capacity is largely in China, it's something that they can be a little bit more flexible about um, because they, they basically, they hold all the chips, right? Figuratively yeah. and literally. Yeah. So, so it's funny you mentioned the word asset class. Um, of course, you and I know all the, everyone's listening, all, all the industry people know that Bitcoin is indeed a, a new asset class, digital asset class. But the funny thing is China, the government, um, they, they sort of are in denial. They either don't want to or they truly don't believe it is a new asset class. So they're denying that it's an asset class, much like they, they, they classify Bitcoin almost like you would, you would categorize like email addresses and digital photographs. 
When I think about email addresses and photographs, we all have email accounts. Oh, that email address belongs to me. You know, these are the photos I took on my iPhone. They're uploaded to the cloud. Those are my photos. I could share them with you. I could, you know, all that stuff. So they almost treat Bitcoin kind of like that, like those digital goods. Okay. Whether it's an email account or a digital photograph or those swords and, you know, shields and World of Warcraft online games. So it's almost classified like that digital property. So they, so, so that's, I guess that's better digital property, but they refuse to make a official ruling to call it an investable asset class. And, and again, the reason is that the, 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 the public reason is they don't want people to lose money by buying these phantom digital assets, you know, quote unquote. Um, they want, they want an orderly society. They want, uh, they want peace, tranquility, and, you know, stable economy and stuff like that. So that's the reason they don't want people to be over-invested in, in cryptocurrency and tokens and so on. Now, of course, over the years, we've seen the rise of shit coins, you know, tokens and all that. And we really saw, you know, really see how bad it can get, right? When people are, are, you know, swindling, when, when these promoters are swindling casual investors money in loading up these, you know, worthless shit, to- shit coins, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, of course, you and I being strong Bitcoin believers, we understand the concept of shit coins being, being worthless. Um, you know, so, so it's funny how the way they, meaning the regulators, the Chinese government, the central bankers, the way they see Bitcoin is how you and I see the shit coins. Mm-hmm. So, so it's kind of like they really, they really don't like it. They really don't like it. So they don't even want to give it a name or label. And, and that's why they, they, uh, they put up all these regulations or the quote unquote regulations and these so-called fake bannings, multiple bannings of Bitcoin over the years. So it's really how that is. And then historically, just to review, they first banned Bitcoin in December of 2013. Mm-hmm. And then, and then it was quiet. You know, the price went down. They're happy. When the price goes down. They're happy, right? Because then it's not on anyone's radar. You know, grandmas are not, are not losing the money on Bitcoin uh, because they've already banned it. Uh, it's when Bitcoin came back up again in 2016, early 17. That's when we got the second phone call. Uh, by the way, all these throughout those three years, we're waiting, we're begging them, hey, please come regulate us. Please give us a license. Tell us what to do, how to do KYC, AML. What are your requirements? What's compliance? You know, what are the compliance requirements? But they, they would give us no attention at all. But of course, they came knocking again in January 2017. That's when they said, oh, you know, this thing, this thing Bitcoin thing, you guys made the price go up to $1,000. Let's, let's squash it back down. Mm-hmm. And as if they're, they're asking us to bring the price back down as if like we had some control over it. We're like, <laughs> we're, we're, I'm flabbergasted. Like, like, hello, <laughs> this is not like a centralized exchange. I could just adjust the price, right? It's not like a order mm-hmm. book. I could just adjust the price. So, um, th- and literally they, the people who came to talk to us in January, 2017, they had instructions from their boss to come tell us to move the price back down. So, you know, it was funny. It was just, it was just hilarious. We have to educate them. Like, how, you know, this is not just my exchange. It's a global network of exchanges. They all run 24 seven. I can't control the prices, you know, any better than anyone else can. Of course, I'm talking to communist party people who are known to be market manipulators and market, they, they don't, mm-hmm. they control prices, right. You know, of commodities, right. In the real well, world. And, and, and the great irony is that um, it took until the end of the year for the CFTC in the U S to finally approve futures. And part of their stated reason yeah. was we got to curb the, the excesses of this bubble and give people a way to go <laughs> short. And so you want to talk about market manipulation, you know, you got, you exactly. got a private visit, exactly. but there was this public uh, pronouncement and, and, um, and, and regulatory approval, which was important, but it was more important to, to curb the runaway freight train in 2017 than it was to, yeah. um, to, to allow for you know, additional speculation. Yeah, I'll um, share a tidbit about early. Would you like to hear more about the regulations? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah please. So I share a tidbit. Not, not many people know about this. It wasn't well recorded in history. But starting in March, to appease the regulators, we actually collectively, the three big exchanges, started an effort where we stopped allowing Bitcoin withdrawals. So you could trade on an exchange. I think you could deposit. If I, yeah, you could deposit, but you can't withdraw. So it's this weird dichotomy where you could put in cash, you could take out cash. You can put in Bitcoin, but you can't withdraw. And the, the mm-hmm. outcome is that the prices would be artificially lower on our exchange than on the outside exchange where there's free flow. So that happened, that stayed on for about three months. So we had a suppressed pricing 
and again, the suppression wasn't it wasn't a suppression that we we did on purpose. It was that we had to disallow withdrawals to appease regulators. But in effect, the prices were appeared to be lower on the exchange, and that happened for about three months. And finally, we gave up. Like this is not working. Um, mm-hmm. And so by June, the prices popped back popped back into the the, the global prices. And that's when we had the FOMO for the uh, for the ICOs. That summer of 2017 was the ICO summer, boom. And you know, and then this the third time they came by was in August September of 2017. That's when they asked all the exchanges to close down. So that was the final shoe, if you will. Yep. Um, and of course, I mean, there there is still exchange activity in the mainland um, unofficially or officially. I, I don't Unoffic- even know. Unofficially. Yeah. I mean, but 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 um, Wobi and, and and OKX have massive offices. Um, outside of Beijing, so um, what what is the reality of of uh, both you know how you would incorporate an exchange, what the rules of the game are, um, and um, and you know do, do you have like CCP members that are in your Monday morning meetings uh, and, and 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 just basically keep some tabs on things, even if the uh, legal incorporation is technically in Hong Kong. What is um, what has been the evolving relationship? that the regulators have with the, yeah. the professional exchanges, right? Let, let's, lay, let's leave the crap aside. But for those giants where we know that significant global liquidity still rests there, um, you know that there's significant real volume, you know that the, the market is real, but it's in this kind of weird gray area where it's not sanctioned, but it's also not been totally illegalized. Right. So, so the two, those are the two large exchanges, OKCoin and Huobi, and there's also Binance, of course. So these three, I believe they all have offices in mainland China, but they're all they're c- categorized as, you know, software development offices and also customer service, customer care centers, customer service centers. Um, the business operations are technically and legally in a different jurisdiction. So they don't have any licenses in China to operate the business and they operate on their website in, in a foreign country, whether it's Hong Kong, the United Kingdom, you know, US or whatever, all these different countries. Uh, Malta and stuff like that. Uh, however, so for the Chinese people to get access to that service, they have to use a VPN because China has a controlled internet. So all the mm-hmm. sanctions, all, all the websites that, that are easily accessible in China have to be sanctioned by the Chinese uh, government. Uh, if you're not sanctioned, you're blacklisted. Literally, no one can get access to your website. All the packets are dropped. There's no DNS resolution and so on. So you have to use a VPN to get access to those. Um, so of course there are many, many exchanges aside from those top three, there are many exchanges that cater to the Chinese market, a lot of smaller ones. Um, and then they cater to the Chinese market by offering their website service and mobile apps in the Chinese language. Uh, they offer rudimentary deposit services in China, sort of under the radar. Um, but it's all done in a, you know, on the lowdown hush hush kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's like, don't ask, don't tell. Yep. And then, um, yeah, that's how it is. Um, what, um, so you took a little time off after the, uh, after the, the sale in, in 2018, um, remind me, who did you sell to? So we sold to a, uh, investment company in Hong Kong. Uh, mm-hmm. so that happened. We, 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 it's actually very fortunate in terms of timing and all that. We started yeah. discussing the deal in November of 2017. They had, they were really interested in our mining pool business. So mm-hmm. they, they're, they're going to, we're either going to spin that off, sell to them, or in the end we made an offer. Uh, they made an offer to buy the whole company, BTCC. Yep. Uh, so that's what happened. The deal was signed in December. And then I think uh, the, the closing itself happened in January. So it was really mm-hmm. fast. Um, it was a, you know, it was a cash deal. And uh, yeah, so, so I was very fortunate that happened. It just worked out the timing that was right around the, the peak of the 2017. Uh, what, 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 hap- yeah. what happened? Was it rebranded or, or what, what did they end up doing with the asset? Uh, so, so we, we, we ourselves rebranded the company from BT China to BTCC. That was in 2015. Mm-hmm. That was in the fall of 2015. So yeah. after that, we operated. We have the BTCC, which was an international business, and BTC China was a was a smaller subsidiary local Chinese business. So the BTC China exchange actually had to be shut down in October of 2017 due to the mm-hmm. request by the regulators. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we sold the international company out to them in the Hong Kong investment company that was in January. And then they took that over. Essentially they had the international exchange. They took over the mining pool business, the BTCC pool. They also took over the Moby wallet and also mm-hmm. the physical Bitcoins business. Uh, but unfortunately I think throughout the rest of 2018, um, they actually shuttered some of these businesses. They launched a, um, 
a affiliate business in Korea called BTCC Korea. That's an exchange over there. Um, they they clo- they have since closed on the mining pool. Uh, that was in late 2018. They also closed on the physical Bitcoins business, the BTCC Mint. So they mm-hmm. I think right now they're operating the BTCC exchange, the main exchange internationally, and they're operating the Mobi wallet. Uh, and also they have the BTCC Korea exchange right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm not involved anymore. So I'm not, I'm not yeah. on the management team. I'm not on the advisory board or anything. So I'm just, I'm just looking at it from the outside. Yeah, uh, this, this, this having a little bit less stressful for you. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm sure the environment in general is just a little bit less stressful than running both a mining pool and, uh, and a major exchange. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, ballet. Yeah, yeah. So I took 2018, I took a sabbatical year. I went, traveled the world, a lot of speaking engagements. Um, and then by end of 18, I was thinking what to do next. So in 2019, early, that well, would be early last year, uh, I committed to starting a new company to solve the problems of wallets uh, to, to, for mass adoption. And, and the, the, the genesis of this is in the BTCC Mint, these physical uh, coins. Let, let me go get a, get a version. I'll show you. Hold on. I have one here. Oh, yeah. You have a BTCC coin? BTCC uh, mint coin? No, I thought. No, you know what? I do in my other bag, but that other bag's in yeah. my apartment. Uh, uh, I have one up not, here. I'll show you guys. So we, let me let me change the background so people people are seeing this, right? People are seeing this. Yes. Uh, yes. So so the the first series of coins. So that's a background. So this is a uh, BTCC mm-hmm. mint. These are titanium coins, physical bitcoins. Um, uh, it's, it's over here, right here on on this side. Uh, they hold one Bitcoin. So at the time when we launched in 2016, these were they hold they were only worth about four or five hundred dollars of Bitcoin, uh, one Bitcoin. We also made the giant the five BTC. This is a five Bitcoin. It's a uh, 50 mm-hmm. millimeters, uh, five yeah 50 mil uh, yeah. Anyways, I think it's 50 five centimeters wide mm-hmm. and half a centimeter thick. Um, nice big ones, all titanium. And then we made other units. Yeah. Anyways. So, and then eventually we made, uh, the poker chips and, and he, I have a real example here. Mm-hmm. This is a BTCC mint poker chip. So we, we, all the coins we put in here were mined by BTCC pool. They're, so they're all freshly newly mined. Zero transaction records all had own block height, coin based rewards. Um, so we, we sold out in everything was sold out. It was just, it was mm-hmm. just tremendous demand globally. Um, so what I wanted to say was that through this experience, we realized that people really found it easy when, when things were physical and, and there's no surprise to this because the, if you look at the world that we live in, we're living in a physical world, despite mm-hmm. all the online engagement, internet and all that stuff. So for many people, whether it's the people who are less savvy, less technical, less crypto industry, people live in the real world and they know how to safeguard a physical object. So if I gave them this, this uh, physical poker chip, um, if I said this is worth a thousand dollars or a million dollars, they would know how to safeguard it. Now, now if it's a million dollars, they probably get really worried and really scared, but if it are worth a hundred dollars, you know, a thousand dollars, they would know how to hide this, right? It's like cash and gold and jewelry. You know how to safeguard it. Mm-hmm. It's regardless, regardless of whether you have a home safe or whether you hide it under your bed mattress or in your drawer or put it at a professional safe vault at a bank or something like that. Um, however, with digital information, with private keys and, you know, digital pr- passphrases, it's very hard. That's why people have such trouble dealing with, you know, what they call these electronic cold storage wallets. Um, uh, so I have a lot of these devices, you know, you know, let's see what I have here. You know, some, you know, some are, some are these, uh, you know, these are traditional, very popular, you know, digital cold storage devices, you know, some are like USB form factor, some have credit card style, NFC. And these things, ultimately, they all require backing up the recovery seed, right? Mm-hmm. This is called the BIP39, BIP44, the BIP recovery seed. It's usually 24 words, sometimes 12 words. You have to write it down on a piece of paper that looks like this. You know, you have to write it down, you know, in order mm-hmm. to do, 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 do. And you have to, you have to keep this safe. And it's just a flimsy piece of paper. People don't laminate this. They don't, they don't put it very... To keep and then something just put in the drawer and and what happens with digital information if you just put it in the drawer you're not really safeguarding your your bitcoins right so so i realized that hey what if can we turn this technology this btcc mint technology right into a wallet product for the mass market okay 
Now, so that's where Ballet was born. So with Ballet, we've turned this product and the, the essence of this product, again, let me show you the, uh, the essence of it, um, is that there is a, uh, I think you can see the stickers, right? You can see the, the reflective stickers. So there is a private key that's printed on the back of this sticker. So there's a hologram sort of silver sticker that if you peel it off, it's tamper evident, they'll leave a residual marking. So you know if it's been peeled off, but regardless, there's a private key behind it. And that's what holds, that's the actual, the, the keys, the, the ownership of the Bitcoins, right? Um, so we said, can we make Bitcoin wallets physical and non-electronic? This is, by the way, this is non-electronic, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing, there's no charging, there's no power issue, there's no USB, there's no NFC, there's no Bluetooth, there's, there's just nothing complicated to make this work. It works, it's dumb as rocks, right? It's literally, you hold it, you can have Bitcoins in there, you could keep it, you could put it in the time capsule, you can hide it in your bed mattress, you can hide it in the freezer, put it in the shoebox. And as long as you don't lose this thing, you don't lose your Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where we said, okay, now let's create this thing called the ballet wallet. And here I have with, with me, this is a stainless steel. I think Ryan, you have a few, right? You wanna open it up, take a look? I have one right here. I had a couple in the office. Yeah. Yes. In, uh, in, in New York. And then you were kind enough to yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. track me down uh, and, yeah. and hook me up with a new one. So, so this is a, a ballet wallet. So let's, uh, let's bring it up to this. Whoops. Oh. My, my virtual background thing. Okay. So yeah, for, and for, those, is, and for those that are listening, it, it basically looks uh, like a, uh, a steel credit card with a QR exactly. code on it and uh, the alphanumeric uh, address laminated kind of like the poker chips so there's a, a tamper resistant steel and uh seal and and should yeah. allow people to understand whether there's uh been anything you know compromised um under the hood here and it just yeah it, it's a hell of a lot harder to lose than the uh small slips of paper that i agree exactly um you can just throw out uh and and, and lead to very unfortunate consequences uh if yeah. you do and then you you want to recover them you know years later yeah so this is inspired by the paper wallet. So let me give you an example of a real paper wallet. Here's a real mm -hmm. paper wallet. Um, so basically you print this out, right? You, you get this, mm -hmm. you print it out and you fold it and, uh, and then you can sort of uh, put your Bitcoins here and it's a paper wallet, right? It's a flimsy piece of paper. It would have the public mm -hmm. deposit address and the private key in the back, hide it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can laminate this store somewhere. But what we've done is we've take the, taken the original paper wallet concept, made it into a very, solid piece of steel and uh we there, there's three significant innovations that's different from this than the paper wallet okay so number one is that we use a two-factor private key so the traditional paper wallet it's one private key per wallet mm -hmm. and one qr code and this is usually made in one location usually it's do it yourself you make it yourself or you make it for your mom right you make mm -hmm. it and you give it to your mother for mother's day uh your mom can trust you so that's great uh, what we do is we, as a company, we have decided to get into the business of making these wallets for other people. So the, so our intended market, unfortunately, is not for experts like yourself, Ryan, not for mm -hmm. industry experts, not for the geeks and the Bitcoin hodlers. Our market, target market is for people who are less savvy and who are interested and curious about Bitcoin. They want to buy a few hundred dollars, you know, tens of dollars, maybe a thousand dollars at most, and they want to hold it but they're not savvy enough to manage their own private keys. They're not ma savvy enough to upgrade their firmware, download software, configure the, the backup systems and to do the BIP39, the, the recovery seeds, or to find the right path to do the coin splitting. All the fancy stuff, they're not savvy enough. So their level of security is at that level only and not at the extreme level. So mm -hmm. this is who this target is for, okay? So we make the system, but it's actually a two-factor private key. This means that the actual private key to the system has not been created yet. It's called the BIP38 two-factor private key. So there's mm -hmm. a there's an encrypted private key which is underneath the sticker. So I'll, I'll peel this one for you guys. So you peel the sticker, and then um, and then there's there's yellow background, and that's the encrypted private key. Mm -hmm. I, I emphasize this is not the actual private key. It's an encrypted private key which has a passphrase, a very long passphrase which is on the bottom of this card, of this card. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you can have, you have to scratch it off. Uh, let me see what basically you have to scratch it off. Uh, 
yeah, anyways, I, I didn't do a good job. But the passphrase. For those listening, Bobby is furiously yeah. scratching off the bottom Scratch. of his card like a scratch yeah, it's, off a, it's like a lottery scratch and, off the and, and, and Bobby, and when you, is, when is, you, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep finish the thought. Oh, no, I was just going to say that once you scratch it off, that's a passphrase. So together, the passphrase and the encrypted private key can then be decoded to actually give you the actual private key. Okay, mm -hmm. so we do this for you, but but just to emphasize for all the geeks and the technical people out there, we as a company, first of all, we don't store the two components. And mm -hmm. most importantly, we don't have your private key. Yep. Because the private key has not even been made yet. Mm -hmm. This is the key thing that people confuse. People think we store the private key, we put it on the hard drive, and we're going to sell sell out your information later. But that, that's just not how our business model works. So the point is, once you combine the two pieces of digital information, the encrypted private key and the passphrase, that's how you get the actual private key and that's when you can move the coins, okay? So again, from the traditional paper wallet, our, the first innovation is a two-factor private key. And we do this in two different countries. We use a two-factor key generation process where we make part of it in the United States, where we make part of it in China. So the two teams that make it don't talk to each other. They're not, they, don't, they cannot collude. And that mm -hmm. um, essentially your data has never been transmitted across the Pacific Ocean so mm -hmm. that they never got tangled together. So once you get the Valley Wallet, if the sticker has not been peeled, if the scratch off is intact, then you have a pristine wallet that is safe to use that no one in the world knows a private key to. Okay, mm -hmm. not even our company, we don't even know it. So that's one um, number one too. Yeah, go ahead. On, on the front here, is this the public key? It's a public deposit address. So technically, so, there's yeah, another so, so you can, key, you, could, you could get these for gifts, load a bunch of them. Exactly. And then it's great for um, gifting. And then uh, how, um, I guess the only time that someone would ever really know whether this was compromised is when they went to redeem it at some point in the future, right? Well, you could, you could I mean, you, you could scan the address and find out what the balance is on the blockchain. And that it hasn't moved, I guess, yeah. That hasn't moved, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, um, so that's the first, so these are great as, as gifts. This, by the way, there's no backup. Okay. Just to clarify, mm -hmm. just like, just like, it's like losing this, cash. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the coin, just like the paper wallet. There's no backup. And mm -hmm. we purposely made this trade off. We don't want the backup because the backup is too hard and too complicated for normal people. And well, what and I the say form, is the form if, factor, if, this, this almost, it almost feels like physical digital gold, right? Exactly. Exactly. It's meant to be heavy. If, if you ever, if you, if some of you may own one of those titanium or sorry, those titanium or steel credit cards, this is heavier than that. This is thicker than heavier than that. So it's really made to be high quality premium feel to it. We have a plastic acrylic case that we store it in. So you can store this really nicely, waterproof and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. One thing is caution, it's not fireproof. It mm -hmm. is not fireproof because the top stickers and all that can burn off in the fire. So store yep. it in a fire safe location. Um, don't lose it, there's no backup. Even if you lose it, you come to us and cry help, we cannot help you. Yep. It's like you buying a bar of gold, you lose a gold, you go to the gold dealer and say, Hey, can I get a refund? Because I lost my piece of gold. You know, you can't get a refund. There's just nothing you can do about it. So once yeah, you I mean, load up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess say, you know, uh, a ton of people will, will yell at me if I don't poke every single hole in, in the security assumptions here. But the, the fact yeah. of the matter is um, that's not the market, right? The, the target, the target Correct. market here are the ones that just want to buy like a physical, you know, uh, gold coin put it in exactly. the fireproof safe and exactly. then forget about it. Right. Exactly. And have that. Um, yep. And then this is a bearer instrument because there's no backup. It's a bearer instrument. If you had a backup, you can't, you can't give it away to your friends because they would say how you would have a copy of it. So there's no backup. It's a bearer instrument. You load up like $200 worth of Bitcoin. You give it to your mother for mother's day. Now, by the way, you wouldn't load this version because this one already peeled, right? It'll be, mm -hmm. if you, if you loaded this one, then, then it's not safe. Well, you wanted to get a new one and you load up, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. And you say, "Hey, mom, happy Mother's Day. Here's some Bitcoin. Hold it for five years." Right? That's the idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the second uh, innovation we made from paper wallets is that this actually has multi currency support. Okay, it has multi currency support, and uh, you can, besides storing Bitcoin, you can store Ethereum, you can store XRP, Litecoin, Zcash, Dogecoin. You know, all like over fifty, hundred coins, all the ERC twenty tokens, anything on here you want, even USDT. USDC stable coin. You can load up a thousand dollars worth of stable coin in here. And um, so we have, we have support for that. So that's very different from traditional paper wallets and it's all done through the BIP38 two factor system. So it's really safe. And the third innovation we have is that we have a very nice software ecosystem support for it. So there's a Bally crypto app uh, mm -hmm. on Android iOS and you can download it. You can scan it easily. And that app is what you use to enable the multi-currency support. 
And also on the app recently, we launched an exchange service using Changely and Change Now. So now within the app, you can then change the coins in here. So if I if I if I if you send me some bitcoins or I load up with some bitcoins and I'm a fan of Litecoin, I can convert it to Litecoin all on the card itself without having to use an exchange service provider, right? Mm -hmm. uh, using the software exchange or change the Litecoin or XRP or whatever. And I can I can get a lot of shit coins, I could change them back into Bitcoin if I wanted to. So those awesome. are the three three things that makes it very different from traditional paper wallets. Well it's 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 definitely uh, an exciting form factor and and I think uh, products like this need a narrative to rally around and they need a bull market. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm yeah. sure that, you know, if, if we do see a positive catalyst from the having, uh, then, then your users are going to be very happy and, and there's going to be a lot of people that are loading up on these giving away as gifts. Um, yeah. And then we have a gold version too. So there's a gold plated version the, that looks really for the, pretty for the, for the, for, for the, the high gifting. rollers. Yeah. For the high rollers, for your mother, for your father's day and all that stuff. That's great. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess what, what is your outlook for the rest of the year? We've got these two, um, you know, uh, unstoppable force meet immovable object, right? Uh, yes, in terms yes. Of the coronavirus on the one hand, which is, you know, uh, wreaking havoc on the global economy and causing liquidity issues worldwide. Yes. Um, but then on the other hand, you've got the, the having um, colliding perfectly in terms of timing with record setting uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus uh, and, and potential emerging market crises. Um, yeah. that could come on the tail end of this. Um, where, um, you know, w w I mean, is, is the having just a meme, right? Uh, or, or does that sell it short in terms of what's going on in the global economy right now? Um, and, and what yeah. investors should expect for, you know, maybe positive momentum, not just next week, but kind of throughout the course of the next 18 months, like we saw in previous yeah. cycles. The, the having is great. The having is, um, so over the years we've seen in the real economy, we've seen a bunch of, uh, recessions and we've seen subsequent what they call quantitative easing so you know after the 2009 you know global financial meltdown uh you know the u.s and many countries engaged in, in printing of money and they do it by essentially buying back um uh they basically they they suck up all the bad bad uh loans out there and they issue cash for it so it's quantitative easing okay so they give out they give out cash for uh, to soak up the balance sheet with uh, with bad uh, bad uh, stocks and loans and all that stuff like the bonds and stuff like that. So they they're printing money in quantum easing and they did it again a few years later. So that was QE two, QE three, and now it's like QE forever, right? Right. We're in a world where there's going to be continued printing of money, and uh, you know recently in the U.S. due to the coronavirus, they approved what is it five trillion, thirty trillion. So I didn't, I don't even keep track. It's always in the trillions. It's multi-digit trillions. And at some point, it's going to be in the quadrillions, and um, money will just be will just be worthless. Where it'll be, you know, ten dollars for a gallon of milk, you know, hundred dollars for a piece of steak, you know, twenty dollars for a McDonald's hamburger. It'll be kind of like that, okay? Um, so today we're talking about McDonald's value meals at one dollar. They used to call McDonald's one dollar value meals, two dollars. Now one day it's going to be ten dollar value meal. It'll be like a McDonald's ten dollar value meal, really cheap, right? Whereas um, whereas everything else, the price of living in the world has really gone up. So with Bitcoin, what we see here is this is your third block having. So I should call it, instead of quantitative easing, this should be the quantitative um, squeezing or the limitation, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. with every block having, we're, we're reducing the new supply of Bitcoin. We're reducing the Bitcoin inflation rate from 50 to 25, from 25 to 12 and a half, from 12 and a half to six and a quarter, okay? So in the next 10 years, so the last 10 years, uh, Ryan, we actually only saw two block havings, okay? In the next 10 years, we'll actually see three block havings. The first one being the one next week, okay? So mm -hmm. we're going to, you know, within 10, by 2030, Bitcoin will be down to like so, it'll be so awesome. It'll be like, we'll be approaching 20 million, 21 million units, and that's going to be it. And this is when the effects will really kick in, when, when the supply demand. Um, Bitcoin is such a great asset class because it's digital. We can move it anywhere we want. Um, uh, you know, it, it can be traded 24 seven. There's no physical cost to holding it. Remember uh, last week, two weeks ago in crude oil, where it went negative. You heard mm -hmm. about this, the, the situation where mm -hmm. the made delivery of crude oil went negative because, because uh, literally by buying the contract, you have to store it somewhere. And if you don't, if you can't store it, you have to sell it. And if you can't sell it for one penny, you have to sell it for a negative money. You have to essentially pay for someone to take it away from you. Well, that's called a, um, a what was that word? Contagion. Anyways, the, the, there's a word for that. It doesn't apply to Bitcoin because Bitcoin, there's no cost 
to store Bitcoin digitally. There's no cost to moving it other than minor, minor you know, transaction fees, okay? Uh, compared to physical gold or crude oil, where there's real actual cost in moving it all around the world. Um, the only downside for Bitcoin is information. If you lose a private key, you're screwed, okay? So there's, there's a pro and con to that. If you lose a private key, you're screwed, but it benefits the rest of us because there's less Bitcoin circulating, right? So mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin really is a superior asset class for, for the new age, for the new civilization, for the digital world internet connected economy. So for there to be a limited supply of it, 21 million, it really makes the world go round. I think, I think it's gonna be very exciting in the next 10 years. Awesome. Uh, well, from, from your lips to God's ears, uh, hopefully <laughs> we will, we will see, uh, another rally here. The famous yeah. Wall Street what, Traders your, Creed. Just yeah, one what do you more, think? What do you, just one yeah, more bull market. No, there's going to be more. It's going to be every, every four years we're going to see a rally, uh, of having induced rally. Um, what, what, what's your take? What's your take? Uh, I think it's a meme, but I think it's a, a narrative that is kicking into high gear at exactly the right time. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I continue to remain as bullish as ever. Uh, I yeah. have not touched uh, my personal portfolio, you know, one way or the other. And even with the, with all the you know coronavirus uh, chaos, the really the only uh, market activity that I participated in was just hedging on the on the downside. Um, yeah. But uh, other than that, have have you know, stayed away. So, yeah. um, trying to just, uh, put the blinders on focus on business and, and task at hand and let this narrative run its course, because I do agree that, uh, this, this next cycle could be, could be yeah. unique. It'll take us to a hundred thousand dollars, I think. Well, we, we shall see soon enough. My friend. We <laughs> shall see yeah. soon enough. But give, um, give, you gotta give us six months. Though. You gotta give us six months, six to eight oh, months. We'll get, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, absolutely, and and especially if, uh, if if the crisis, the health crisis, uh, and economic crisis subsides a little bit, uh, that that would obviously you know juice juice the timing, and, and I think the uh, the the probability that we see a good outcome here. Um, yeah, uh, Bobby, uh, thanks for joining. I uh, really appreciate you uh, sharing some some of your insights and and some of the old stories, and and particularly around uh, China and, and and the mining markets. Where can people find you? Um, and uh, and ballet because uh, I'm sure yeah, when sure. we do have our next rally, there's going to be a lot of folks that want to give gifts. Sure, maybe not Mother's Day because that's just a couple days away uh, here in the U.S. Yeah. But uh, but maybe for um, yeah, these, these are great Christmas so this year, the holidays could, this year. You could buy these on our web store. You go to balletcrypto.com, uh, b a l l e t c r y p t o. We picked them in ballet. Ballet, as, as people know, is the dance, is the you know, traditional ballet dance. Uh, we put one name that was uh, female friendly, something that was gender uh, friendly, not just all geeks and guys. Uh, we want to, you know, something that's easily pronounceable by the whole world. So ballet is a name. And you can buy this uh, besides on balletcrypto.com. You can also get this on Amazon. Uh, go to Amazon. You can get next day delivery in some places, you know, two days delivery, whatever. Um, search for ballet, crypto ballet wallet. Uh, and then these are great, not just for Mother's Day, for Father's Day, you know, for graduation gifts, for birthday gifts weddings engagements if you go to a wedding as a wedding gift you can give bitcoin um uh you know even if people you know men or women who want to get married want to propose this is a good proposal gift instead of diamond ring or in addition to a diamond ring get like a real full bitcoin loader on one of these gold wallets really nice i yeah. I, because, I do i do not, i do not recommend this but i appreciate <laughs> i appreciate the hustle bobby um check it check it yeah. out so he doesn't ruin your yeah, engagement yeah. and your marriage yeah. One, one thing I want to point out is that traditionally when you give Bitcoin, it's a multi-process where if you involve the recipient, ask them for their Bitcoin deposit address. And yep. if they don't have the wallet, they have to go set it up. So it's a very cumbersome process. With ballet, what you do is you, the giver, can buy the wallet, load it with Bitcoins. The QR code is right there. It's ready to go. There's no setup whatsoever. And then you can then hand this to the recipient, give them the gift of Bitcoin without their permission. And that is so simple. That's the beauty of the Bali ecosystem. Okay. Awesome. Well, best of luck. I, uh, I, I, I can assure you that this is not a sponsored session uh, of, the, <laughs> of the podcast, uh, but I, I do think it's, uh, it's exciting. Um, yeah. And uh, I hope, hope a lot of people will check it out uh, as well. Bobby, yeah. it's, it's always a pleasure and I uh, hope to see you again in the flesh soon. Yeah, we're going to get this, we're gonna get this to, in, to the hands of a billion people in, over the next few rallies. Let's do it. Okay, I good, love good. It. That will be a very okay. good thing if that, if that no, comes it would, to fruition. Because that's how we're going to get to a billion people and five billion people. We want the whole world to own Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And the way to do that is to have a physical way, an easy physical way to do it, aside from all the 
other amazing wallet solutions out there. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Bobby, uh, thanks again for your time today. Thank you to everybody that tuned in for this episode. Very special episode sponsored by Bitstamp. We are discussing the Bitcoin having and other early war stories with Bobby Lee, who is about as OG as you get across two different continents. So thank you very much. Uh, and everybody else, stay safe, be good. Until next time, peace.